you need to see it before you can draw. And I'd say, well, I don't see it. He said, well, well, of course you do. How do you draw it if you don't see it? So I really don't know. But I know that I have a feeling, and it's actually in the drawing of it that I, that I realize what's inside of me, but I don't have a picture in my head. Um, and I thought that was... I didn't realize I was strange that way. But then I watched Milk Paul draw. And Milk Paul saw a drawing completely done in his head. Because he was like, he would draw it and it was just coming out as if it was projected from his mind. And I was envious of that. For me, it's a much more cathartic thing that I have to pour myself into it. I turn off the light in my studio and so it's just one light on the drawing board. I completely lose myself in that moment. That's just how it has to be for me. Okay, we have another question from Twitter. Glenn, where do you see the future of animation heading? How do you think the internet can help you? Well, the thing that, that I love about this duet and the spotlight stories that we're doing with Windy Day, Buggy Night Duet, is that it's a way of taking animation and making it really personal. There's something really personal about, about the internet. It's in everybody's home. It's in your bedroom. It's in your kitchen. It's in your pocket. It's in your pocket. Yeah. I mean, we keep talking about different films being done for uh, this device, the Spotlight Stories, and it's become a festival in your pocket, a different, unique story. But it, the story duet came out yesterday, two days ago, and people were getting it, they were receiving it as a gift, but it was happening at like three in the morning. So it might be a, a couple and they notice it comes on the phone, and we're getting emails from them saying like one couple, they were hoping someday that they could have a baby. And, and they were hoping, and they saw this animation of this little story. This is the email we got two days ago. And they said, we saw this as a sign from God that we, maybe this, it's, we're going to have a baby. In the morning, she took her pregnancy test, she's pregnant. So, we have to have a disclaimer now on duet. Warning, this app may cause pregnancy. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I, I, uh, I want to ask you quickly about your, uh, your, you talked about your household. And uh, as everyone may or may not know, uh, Glenn is the son of Bill Keen, who uh, created and uh, drew the great comic strip Family Circus. I also drew, I, I, I threw out channel chuckles, which I remember right. reading when I was a kid in the TV section. Thank you for remembering that. The, uh, I, I mean, where did your animation love to, to move the drawings come from? Obviously you grew up in a background with drawing. So, well, it's interesting. My dad, um, yeah, so I lived in a home where it was just naturally that you are surrounded by a uh, guy who's a cartoonist, Dad was an entertainer. He really wanted to be a stand-up comic. So at dinner time was him telling jokes. Right. You know, and to a bunch of little little kids, you know, five years old, he's telling these these jokes and and I'd say, I don't get it. And he'd say, I only tell him, I don't explain him. <laughs> but it was Dad was a funny guy. And but he always said, you know, Glenn, I'm a cartoonist, you're an artist. And he had never gone to art school, and there was a, a desire for classical training. I mean, he was a phenomenal watercolor painter, and he valued figurative drawing. So he gave me a book, Fern uh, Hogarth's Dynamic Anatomy, when I was in fourth grade. And uh, so I started to just draw the figure. I remember going on the school bus with all these drawings of figurative drawings, and. Other kids coming around and looking, going, hey, "Keen's drawing naked guys." Okay, I realized I wasn't the same as everybody else, but it was really natural to have Dad as uh, as an inspiration for me. He drew with a six-inch pencil, 
and I grew up in 10B. So, I mean, we're a little different that way, but he was a big influence. Particularly in the, the thing that he would say, you, you have to draw what you know. You, you have to draw what you can identify with. And that's been pretty much my pattern for my whole life. Every character that I've animated, I've had to crawl under the skin and be that. I think, uh, I think we have another uh, Twitter question. How did working on your own project compare to working for a studio? Good question. Um, well, it's interesting because um, I do have a feeling, a belief about studios that every studio seems to have its own atmosphere. Uh, and that you think creatively in a, in a similar way, like Disney films, they feel like Disney films. Pixar films are not Disney films, they, they feel like Pixar films. And it's almost as if the air you breathe when you go to Pixar, you're going you're to think that way. DreamWorks the same way. There's like, there's like planetary systems that you think creatively a little different. So leaving and creating uh, a little studio when King Productions um, happened just before going up to Google. So it was more like we just took myself, Max, Team, Jenny Rim, because there's only three of us in Glen King Productions at the moment, and we moved up there to Mountain View to work at Google. And really created a, a little mini studio there. And as I said, the um, duet is like the first fruit that fell from this tree. And there's a certain quality to that story that I really like. There's a taste to that fruit. I, mean, I, I love stories that have something to do about goodness, about um, that there's a design and a purpose and living up and fun, discovering who you are, living in a way that lets you become who you're meant to be. Stories have got that theme. I love that theme. But I imagine that's starting to create a little bit of an atmosphere. So I, I love the fact that there's um, a chance to do that. What was interesting was leaving Hollywood because we went into an environment where there is no filmmaking being done. I mean, try to find an art store, it's almost impossible. Find a pencil, find a pencil shop. People don't use pencil shop. You know, it, it was a really unusual environment. In our little studio, we had half the room was programmers, and you would hear them clicking on their keyboard. The other half was drawing paper between Sarah and myself, and you'd hear shh, 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 wonderful little music going on. How long did it take to uh, the production of the duet when you were in that Mountain View studio? How many? Was it a few months? Well, same length of time for a gestation period for a baby. Really? Oh, nine months. Nine months. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. The, um, I want to also, being me, I, everybody here wants to know about Pocahontas and Tarzan and Beast, and but I'm going to ask you quickly again about your, your earlier era in animation. You worked a little for Filmation. Is that true? <laughs> well, yeah. I worked there for a summer. Yeah. Um, I came in with, um, I had to draw Fat Albert to get in. And they just showed me a model sheet. I did all kinds of drawings of Fat Albert. And the head of the department um, looked at it and said, well, these are really, really wonderful. And they were excited and they hired me. Well, that's not what they were going to ask me to do, though. For the rest of that summer, I had to do stop animation of cycles and figure things out. And it was a nightmare for me. But you did that before Disney. That was before you got over with Disney. Yeah. Excuse me? That was before Disney. Yeah, this yeah. was before Disney. I was uh, 19. Oh. And uh, by the end of the summer, uh, the head of the department said, So, Glenn, are you uh, going back to school? I said, um, Yeah, I'm going to go back to Cal Arts. Well, that's good because if you weren't, they'd fire you because you draw like a three year old. <laughs> that's and a badge of honor to get fired from the relation. I, I guess. I don't, but I took it really hard. I mean, at that age, you yeah. you know you don't draw well. And I really do believe that, that I 
feel like I'm always faking it, that I I never I never know enough. Um, when I see the portfolios of the people around here, you guys all would have been so much better than me. Uh, in where I, what level I was at, I was nowhere near where you are at. Um, so it's really humbling when I, when I see student films, and I'm just blown away at the quality, the level, the talent. I mean, when Ollie is saying you're going to do greater things than us, I just look around here and I think, okay, that's part of it. It's passing it on to a generation that really will do something greater than that. Well, then I'm going to hit that. Whatever you do next, you're, you're a leader. You're a natural leader. Right? You're going to have a lot of followers, so whatever you're doing next, you know, please do it. Uh, so a lot of people are waiting and want to see it. Let's take another question from Twitter. Gwen, can you talk about your design philosophy for female characters such as Rapunzel, Ariel, etc.? Well, I have a, a strange belief um, that the character exists before I draw them. I never would have said this before because it doesn't make any sense, but it's actually the what I have experienced. Because I I will draw characters, you know, I'll do so many different designs, like for the beast. I six months of drawing different versions of the beast and people come in, Oh, that's kinda cool. Is that what he's gonna look like? I'm like, no, that's not him. I'm like, well, why not? He looks looks good. I'm like, yeah, that's not him. And then there was somebody, and I, I just knew it wasn't him. And it, the same feeling with Pocahontas, same feeling with Ariel, so all of these characters. And then there's a certain point where you're drawing. Uh, I remember Bruce Johnson, one of the other animators coming in. So what's the piece going to look like? So I started, well, I kind of be like this gorilla shape with this buff 